Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 332. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because one of the important things to understand is it's not really about how much money you make all the time, but it's also about how much money you can keep. And more importantly than just keeping the money is making sure that it, it does what you want it to do and making sure that you take advantage of every opportunity that you can because if you're out there providing jobs, providing energy, providing food, providing housing, there are a number of tax credits and things that you can take advantage of, but only if you know the rules. This can get complicated and therefore, fortunately, we have people, entrepreneurs who have gone out there and said, I will tackle that tax code for you and I have another person here today who said that. I will tackle that tax code for you because he himself had his own tax problem. And that's one of the best ways to solve, uh, to, to be, to build a business is to solve your own problem and then offer that solution to other people. I have with me today none other than John Pollock of Financial Gravity. And what's really interesting to understand is what I like that they recently went public. So there's a whole, you know, we could do an entire podcast just on that one thing right there. Yes, we but could. He, <laughs> I figured you would say something there. But here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to do our best to make sure, because I know that most of you, you're not trying to go public today. What I want to do is make sure that we focus the information and the understanding on the things that are going to help you put more money in your pocket, build that bigger, better, better business, and most importantly, become the entrepreneur that you want to be. So help me welcome. Make sure you're ready to take some notes from John. Pollock. John, you there? I am here. Thanks for being here, sir. I am so glad that you are taking the time uh, from your day to to share your expertise, your wisdom with us here at the Cashflow Diary. So um, this being your first time here, I have a question that I tend to ask everybody, and I've got to therefore ask you the same question. Are you ready? Bring it. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, occasionally entrepreneurs, we can believe that we are, I don't know, flying around, saving our customers. Maybe we even dress up in tights and have a cape. Also, like superheroes, entrepreneurs have a beginning. I mean, if you think about it, Spider-Man was just kind of a college kid, you know, uh, taking some photos, trying to make ends meet. That was it. And then one day he gets bit by a spider and suddenly he has to decide, do I offer my special talent to the world? Do I do good or evil? And then he becomes the Spider-Man we all know and love. So my question to you, sir, is before being able to get your company to go public, before becoming a, a, a tax expert, if you will, before helping other people you know, raise their profit, create their own wealth, lower their tax liability, what we want to know is who is John Pollock? Well, one thing I'd actually add to that, to your superhero story, is that every entrepreneur actually has a superpower already. And unlike the superheroes in comic books like that. Uh, that get got eaten by or got bit by something or got struck by something, uh, we already have it within us. The hardest part is to find it and then have the confidence to run with it. And that's kind of my story in a kind of a little bit of a nutshell is, I mean, I started out as a sales guy. I'm, I'm good at selling. I'm good at convincing. I'm, I'm very good at persuading. Uh, I do have a moral compass, so I was never really good at persuading people to do things that I didn't believe in myself. So I had to have a, a passion for it. 
And so I got into corporate sales. I don't have a college degree. It is not a prerequisite Woo-hoo. in the world. Is a, yeah, it's not a prerequisite. You don't, in fact, we live in a, in a time where there's more knowledge and more data at your fingertips. I mean, the number of podcasts, the number of books. I mean, I read several books a month because I, I do Audible and I, I listen to everything at 2x. I've heard entrepreneurs that listen at 3x. So you can consume a massive amount of very high quality information very quickly. And your brain is very good at uh, absorbing that. At least mine is. Maybe that's my superhero, my superpower. But <laughs> I, I absorb a lot of energy. So even though I didn't get a college degree, I'm a, I'm a, a student, a, a constant, constant student. So – but I was also good at sales. So I went into sales. I was in corporate sales and the corporations I kept working for kept getting rid of me because what I found out later is I'm unemployable as I kept trying to solve <laughs> their problems. You know, you know, what you're doing wrong. You should do this. It'd be, you'd sell a lot more. And they like, kid, listen, go away. So about uh, it's actually 2002, I moved to the Dallas Metroplex. I grew up in Los Angeles. I moved to Denver, lived there for 10 years, and then moved to Dallas. And right after I moved to Dallas with the company, I lost my job. And I said, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm going to start my own business. What can I sell? And I had four kids. So I had just moved here, knew no one, had four kids. What can I sell that makes the most amount of money the fastest to support my young family? Uh, it was insurance. So I got into insurance sales, which is <laughs> <laughs> true. Uh, it's actually changing though. That's that, that, those days are, are, are waning very quickly. So I started selling a product called a fixed index annuity that at the time was paying as much as 12% commissions. Now they're paying around six. So huge, huge disruption in that industry. But I started selling annuities, realized that annuities were not a good model because you sell it, you get all this money up front and then you have to go find another client. It's almost like being a, a, a real estate salesperson. Right. With real estate, you know, every three to four years, people get bored with their house and they want another one. But with this, it's it was a ten year, twenty year product, so you they buy it and they're in it for twenty years. So I started to get into wealth management where I can get a recurring revenue stream, and I started doing very well at that. And this is where kind of the crux of my <laughs> my story hits is I started making a ton of money, and I kept hearing in a couple election cycles ago about rich people not paying their fair share. And I started looking at the checks I was writing, and I was like, I don't know what fair is, but these numbers don't feel fair to me. I know how hard I've been working. I know I've taken all the risk. I you know, I barely made it through month after month, you know, taking risk. I mean, I'm paying out huge dollars in marketing and hoping that the money came back, hoping that I can cover my mortgage. And now I got to give up 30, 40% of my income. It just didn't seem fair. So uh, I, I went to the place that most of you would think to go to. I went to the CPA. Now, keep in mind, I'm a financial advisor, so I speak the accounting and, and financial language. I know what a non-qualified fund is. I know what a qualified fund is. I kind of – I kind of – I'm, I'm like a, an accountant's worst nightmare. I it's, it's like I've studied what they do, but I don't really know how to do it. But when they – if they lied to me, I would know because I, I know their language. Well – I started meeting with accountants and saying, how do I lower my taxes? I hear rich people don't pay their fair share. I think I am. How do I solve this? And I got the same the same answer, and I interviewed over a dozen over and over again. Mr. Pollock, you make what you make. You owe what you owe. That's the system. There's nothing you can do about it. So then I started huh. thinking, well, does that mean that super rich people have like a special tax code? There's like a door. And it says super rich on it. And you knock on it and they open it up and they say, are you super rich? And I lie to them and say, yes. And then they say, well, <laughs> let me see your tax return. And I show it to them and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, you're not super rich. You lied. Go away. I was wondering if that existed. Maybe there's like, you know, <laughs> some club. And what I found out after doing some research is, is there is no super rich door. Um, and the tax code is written for everybody. And it's whoa, all there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a lot of people right now who might not understand what you mean by that one little piece and because that's that's important to understand when you say the 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 tax code is for everybody the tax code is written for everybody so it, it's and in fact it's written less for rich people and more for non-rich people so let me kind of cast a wider net on this and make this more clear to people and this is something that i've discovered uh, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last six or seven years and what I found out is basically the tax code. So think of it this way. 
Congress and the House of Representatives and the Senate, they work very hard and they fight <laughs> tooth and nail to create a law. And then they send it to the president. And the president's almost always competing with the Senate and the House of Representatives. So whether the president is a Democrat or Republican, it, it tends in this country, if you go back you know, 50 years, it tends to be – they don't – we never seem to elect the same group to both – to all the same legislative and, and the, the executive branches. I don't know why that is. It just is. Probably a good thing. But either way, you got Congress creating laws, sending to the president, and then he has to sign it. And they're fighting the entire time. So when a law finally gets into the tax code, a lot of people work really hard to get it there. Right. So the fact that nobody's using these laws is just crazy. So let me give you an example. I'm going to throw out a, a, a silly law none of you have heard of, none of you are using, but virtually <laughs> everybody can save $1,000 right now by using it. Okay, okay, hold on, hold Ready? on. So this, this, I, is, this is the $1,000 podcast uh, nugget right here. Go yeah, for this it. this is it. So you, know, you, can, you can go home and you can get your money's worth out of this. So there's a, there's a thing, and you can Google this. You can Google Augusta Rule, So like, like the golf course Augusta Rule. It's, it's not – in the tax code under Augusta rule, but it's under it's in the tax code under the 14 day rental rule. You can rent your house to yourself 14 days a month or 14 days a year, excuse me, tax free. So let's say I rent my my house to myself for a thousand dollars. That means I can pay myself out of my business as a business expense, which means it's a tax deduction to the business. I write fourteen thousand dollars out of my business into my personal checking account. And I do not have to declare it as income. That's in the tax code. It's been in the tax code okay, okay, okay. for hold on, decades. So let's say, let's say, let's say you, oh, let's say you're hold on, hold on. Did you, I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. <laughs> yeah. Cause I think, all right, all right, all right, hold on. I'm just want to, I want to process what you just said. Yeah. I can rent my house to myself. Yep. That I'm trying to understand that in and of itself. Let's before we, you know, blow, you've already blown our mind. So help me understand this because that sounded like some money I could save. Yeah. Uh, so so if you're in the 25 percent tax bracket, let's use easy math. Let's say you just you you just do ten thousand this year. So if you write ten thousand out of your business to yourself in taxable income in tax free income, and you're in the 25 percent tax bracket, you've just saved yourself twenty five hundred bucks now. That's the the easy part. The hard part is is you got to document this. You can't just give yourself a thousand dollars. You have to justify that the house is worth a thousand dollars. Dang it! I was so close. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's never it's never as easy as it it's sold. But the, the but the but it's still there. And if you have a company that helps you do it, and once it's set up, if I showed you that all you have to do is a little paperwork every year. I mean, we're talking two or three forms in five minutes, and you're going to save yourself twenty five hundred to $4,000 a year every year, you're going to do it. And that's just one. I haven't even gotten into the other 200 uh, things in the tax code. Now, remember, the tax code is written for a reason. And this is something I think people don't understand. People are afraid of the tax code. But the tax code, was it was hard for the stuff to get there, which I just explained. And once it's there, it's there because they want you to use it. Think of it, whether a Republican's in office or a Democrat's in office, they're going to pull certain levers to run the economy the way they want it to run. So they're going to – and the only way they can do that is with the tax code. So if I say uh, I want more small business owners to work out of their house. So now I'm president, John Pollock, and I want more business owners to run their business out of the house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that for every dollar you spend – for your business, I'm going to give you a tax credit of $4. That doesn't exist right now, but that, that was something I could do as the president or as, as a legislature to encourage more people. And then all of a sudden, you know, Coca-Cola is going to start sending all their executives home to, to, to run businesses out of their house because they'll save all this money on taxes. So through this tax strategy that I created as a president and introduced it into the economy, people started to change their behavior. What's interesting about our tax code is we have 70,000 pages and people ignore it and they're afraid of it, which is weird because – whoa, 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 hold on. You said 70,000 pages though, dude. I mean, come on. We we have a hard enough time reading a 200-page <laughs> book yeah, <laughs> you no said, that we, that, that's entertaining. 70,000 – 200-page book that's entertaining yeah. versus <laughs> a 70,000-page – 
tax code, which is, you know, the cure for insomnia. Right. Like, it really? is a cure for insomnia. You won't even get through the first 10 pages. So the advantage you have is that you have companies like ours that have already done the work. We've actually narrowed the the, the entire tax count code down to a few hundred strategies. And then you come into our office and then we're going to pick the top 10. Most people that come into our office, we could probably do anywhere from 50 to 100 strategies for everybody. But we also know that that's paralyzing. If I, if I told you, here, here's the 50 things that you're going to do this year, you're going to like, how do I even, I have to, I have a job, I got work to do, I can't do these 50 things. So we pick the 10 things that are going to give you the the biggest bang for the buck, and then we, we work on those in year one, and then we start to work on the other ones. So like the 14-day rental rules, actually super easy to set up, it's super easy to document, and it's easy to make sure you get paid, and it's documented right on your tax returns. So that's an easy win. So we'll do that first. Um, but some of the more complex ones, or let's use a, you know, mileage on your car. When I was a kid, <laughs> back years ago, um, when <laughs> I was a kid. Long. Right, right. Had, this is back when Jackson Pollock was around. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah, Jackson, got it. You know, it was, it was, a, was a thing. Um, when I drove around in sales, I had a little book in my glove box and I would have to take out that book, you know, once a day and I'd write down my mileage in the morning. And when I got home, I'd write down my mileage and I calculate that. And then that would be my tax write off. So that could actually save you a ton of money, but it was a lot of work. And I frankly never did it. Um, or I figured out how to do it after the fact. Well, the good news now is we've got apps. There's an app called mile IQ. You just download the app, you pay them a few bucks and every time you go on a car, a little thing pops up. You swipe right if it's personal. You swipe left if it's business. If you swipe left, it brings up another screen. You just say, "Hey, I was on my way to to do a podcast at a at a you know local Starbucks, and here's the mileage yes. in there." So now now you don't even have to use a book anymore. You've got an app that's going to do it for you. So we live in 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 a time where little apps like this can save us thousands of dollars in taxes. And it was, it's not even a hassle anymore because, and then it's interesting is it backs up to Dropbox. So it's like all the data and it's, and it shows your exact route. Kind of like when you're on an Uber ride, you know exactly what your route was. This, this, this isn't counting on, you know, you pretending what mileage you did like I did in the old days. Um, this actually shows you, this is where, this is when you left the house. This is when you arrived at your other business and you can even build into the app uh, a deduction. So if it's two miles to my office, and I go straight from my house to a business, I have to deduct the, the amount of mileage from my house to my office from that business trip. That's the law. Well, you can actually build that into the app and it's all done for you. So there's some really cool wow. things out there that make this, 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 the stuff that we do a lot, a lot more uh, easy to implement. But the bottom line is, is the tax code was written for the small business owner. Small business owners are the backbone of the economy. And a lot of the really cool stuff in the tax code is all driven towards small business owners. There are four different ways to write off a home office. Um, it drives me nuts when I hear from an accountant that um, the home office deduction is a red flag. It has not been a red flag since Al Gore invented the Internet. <laughs> OK, OK. So I, I've got a, I got a question here, though. All right. um, when it comes to understanding, say, just... I don't know, some, I mean, the tax code can, as you said, it feels overwhelming for a number of us, right? I mean, it's that that's not like new information, but w why would you say, I mean, that, why do you think so few of us actually take advantage of any of, of the things that, I mean, if they're that, if they're that plentiful and if that's really the purpose, why does it, how did it get the bad rap it's got? Well, I, I think there's a couple of reasons. First of all, the IRS is a collection agency. They want you to be afraid of them. I mean, that is that is in, in the United States of America, you can't get thrown into jail. You can't get, you know, put in the stocks, <laughs> put out on the public square. No one's going to flog you. Um, so there's really not a lot of threats. You know, they're not going to take you away from your family. So, there, I mean, it's still pretty scary, some of the stuff they can do. But the reality is, is that you're not going to die by not paying your taxes. So the IRS really needs to, it's it's in their best interest to instill fear. But the challenge has come is that the accounting industry has actually perpetuated that. And I'm not sure why, because I tell people that everybody wants two things from their accountant. Number one, they want to pay lower taxes. And number two, lower personal income taxes. And number two, they want numbers that help them run their business better. And accountants don't do either. 
Accountants are historians. They record what you've already done. They put it on a tax return and they file it. So they're preparers. They're filers. They're not planners. And what's interesting about the accounting industry is typically the the type of person that's attracted to the accounting industry uh, is not the type of person that's really good at proactive planning. They're really good at putting numbers and boxes over and over again. And this isn't a, a knock on them because the CPA exam is one of the single hardest uh, designations you can get. It's a two-day test. I mean, we're talking six hours, two days testing to get those three little initials. So these are objectively very, very bright people. The challenge we run into is the fact that these very bright people are not good at the thing that we need them to be good at. And that is a problem. And so, and I found that out when I started interviewing accountants and realizing, wait a second, none of them know how to solve my problem and I hear rich people aren't paying their fair share. So what are the rich people doing? Well, they're, they're hiring fancy, expensive tax attorneys. Well, I can't afford a fancy, expensive tax attorney. So fortunately, I did a lot of research and I ran into a company, which we subsequently ended up buying, <laughs> called Tax Coach Software. And Tax Coach Software actually provides a software that does proactive tax planning for accountants. And I, I met with the CEO and I talked to them. I started using their product. I started advising my own clients. I started using the, the information myself. And actually last year we bought that company. So, so make sure you build a good company. Somebody may, may want to buy you something. <laughs> <laughs> I like, well, I like that idea, but I, I also like how you're going about solving the problem. You're, you're doing it in a completely different way that is, probably counter to the common culture or just the way that, you know, I might do it or anyone might do it for that matter. You're just actually trying, you were solving a problem. You weren't necessarily saying, Hey, one day what I want to do is I want to start a business. And when I want to start my business, um, this is what the business was, was really going to be or what it was going to be about. So I guess then the, the question is important lesson, by the way, a lot of mean? people are sitting at home right now designing the perfect future, and I can assure you what you're designing now and what you have five years from now will look nothing like it. Remember, I was a wealth again. management firm, and we went public as a tax planning firm that doesn't have any CPAs on staff. That's yeah. if, if you told me five years ago that that would be my destiny, I would have thought you were absolutely nuts. And here we are. And that's that's what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur pivots. They solve problems. We did, actually didn't even want to get into bookkeeping and payroll. We didn't want to be in that business at all. But what happened is we were delivering plans to our clients. The clients were taking it back to their accountant. The accountant was saying, yeah, I'm not comfortable with implementing these strategies. And then we would call the accountant and say, are we doing anything illegal? Well, no. How about it? Are we doing anything unethical? No, you're not doing anything unethical. How about immoral? Maybe we're just being immoral. No, 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 you're not being immoral either. So we're not being illegal, immoral, or unethical. So what's the big deal? I don't know. I'm just not comfortable with it. And it was nuts. And I was like, how, how could this be? And I, I actually, this happened so many times that it wasn't an isolate. It wasn't like one accountant that did this. It happened over and over and over again. And I actually kind of started joking internally that you know, we were trying to join the accounting industry. We were going to create these tax plans, give it to the accounting industry. They would see how good they were. They'd want to work with us, and they would send more clients our way, and we would never have to market again. The exact opposite happened. They blocked everything <laughs> we to do. And so we said, okay, so if we can't join them, you know, the old saying, you can't beat them, join them. We flipped it. If we can't join them, we'll beat them. So we built a what? business model that is now beating every. Right now, we have a 90% of the people that come in for a tax blueprint file their, fire their CPA. Wow. Okay. So, so that, they I mean, that, with us. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly what I, I, what I like. And I think that's what happens with innovation a number of times. I mean, because you're bringing up something that I think a number of entrepreneurs are experiencing right now. Um, because they're, they're trying to do something new, maybe something they've never done before. And because it's never been done the way that they now want to do it, there, there's this old guard, if you will, that says, well, that's not how we do it. We're not comfortable. Or the ever popular, you can't do that. Yo, um, yeah. And this is the very thing that you've, you've tackled in this bear you wrestled to the ground because it wasn't that it couldn't be done. It's just it was more they weren't used to doing it that way. So they didn't. 
And yet all that entire time, that means all of their clients, whomever they were, were not get, taking advantage of the very things that you guys were bringing to the marketplace and therefore probably giving way more money in taxes than they had to. Is that what you're basically telling me? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And and what, this is a really great lesson for the people that are listening is so I was older. So I was older. So I was in my mid 40s when I kind of discovered the model. I'm 50 now. I was in my mid 40s and I was old enough and had the confidence enough to say, you know what? I'm right. And I don't care what these people say. But if you're in your 20s, it's kind of hard to have that. Well, you know, because the, the doubt starts to creep in when you're younger. You're thinking, well, you know, these old people are telling me that I'm nuts. So I'm going to give you an example so that you do, so the you young people that are listening to this will have the confidence and go after it. Because think of Uber. Do, do, we, do we need Uber, to? Well, do we need to define what young is? Because realize, <laughs> I still feel young. I think fifty is in that. The closer I get to fifty, I still think that's young. So let's yeah, I have a lot really of clients that are in their eighties. So I feel I, I I joke with them all the time. I had someone in my office the other day. I said, "Well, you guys are still young." He says, "I'm sixty-eight." I said, "Well, that's eighteen years away from me." So I'm calling it young. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I'm, but think about it. If you're out. You're not middle age yet. You know, you're you're still in the twenties and thirties. Probably the millennial would be. The young. I'm in. I'm a Gen X. So the 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 linea, the millennials that will will be considered young for this scenario. Um, some if you've had success and you've already had that confidence built in. But what I'm trying to do is infuse into people that they should have the confidence. If I had confidence in myself 15 years earlier, I can't imagine where I'd be today. So that's what I'm trying to do for your audience. Is I want them to have the confidence before they have age. You can have confidence and you can be right. When you're young. And the reason I like to use Uber as an example is I, I don't know if this was true, but I can imagine that somebody at Uber went to a taxi company and said, you know, this is kind of stupid that you, just, you, you park outside of hotels in a line and you have to wait. Wouldn't it be cool if there's an app that would just call you? And I can imagine they probably called on all the cab companies and all the cab companies said, that's stupid. We make a ton of money just driving around town and people hailing us. An app, no one's going to use an app. And now the taxi industry is being eviscerated. I mean, it's anybody that's listening that uses a taxi. And then if, if you use Uber and go back to the taxi, you'll be mad. Because you're like, why did I use a taxi? Again? <laughs> how, well, the, how's, how's this business still in, 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 in this happening with Airbnb? I mean, oh the boy. stuff that's happening in our world today is staggering. The largest hotel chain in the world was started less than five years ago. Airbnb, right. Hilton I had a, you know, Hilton, Marriott, these companies had 20, 30, 40, 50 year head starts. And one company with an app is now has more hotel rooms than Hilton and Marriott combined. I mean, that's the world we're living in. That's, that's crazy. If you really, if you really try to wrap your head around that, the largest hotel chain is four or five years old. I, I well, you're, you're bringing up Lots of things that are near and dear to my heart, especially when you start talking about Airbnb um, and Uber. I, I have uh, most of the audience doesn't even know this. I have I don't have a car anymore because I literally Uber everywhere I want to go. Because I'm glad you brought out, that up because here's it, my prediction: if you're born that? today, you will never drive a car. Oh, I, I can I can see that I can see that completely because I, I I've if done you're the not doing it, it it's actually and you're cheaper. an early adopter. It's coming. It's cheaper to not actually own a car. Yeah, you don't. Like, you never have to find a parking spot. You don't have to pay for insurance. Now you can actually maybe you know what you can do with your garage is you can turn it into a room and make it into an Airbnb and you can rent it out for <laughs> days a year tax free. Shh, 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 stop. Why are you telling people all my secrets? No, I'm just telling. <laughs> but yes, and this is these are there's so the many we live in. I know that that, but that's what's exciting, and it, it, it's oh. rare that you can find someone who can then report this information to the IRS because I, I know they recently went through this whole process of trying to figure out how do we even handle reporting of income from the sharing economy or or whatever you want to call it. It it, it is. It, these things are transformative, and that's the thing that I, I'm glad you're bringing. I mean, you've brought it to the CPA industry and, and helping them understand that 
they have to change. Like change is part of the whole thing. And that's what entrepreneurs, that's what we do. And you're doing it in a completely different fashion for sure. Uh, but you, it still has to be done because the, you know, if anything, society desires to evolve over and over and over again. So I, I guess my question to you then, because you, you brought something up that I thought was really, really interesting. You said uh, earlier, because this is very, very true, the superhero has to eventually just realize that they have a superpower. And then right. once they realize they have that superpower, then they've got to decide, what am I going to do with it, good or evil? So how did right. you decide or define or discover your superpower and then ultimately go, well, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do with it? Yeah, so this is this is actually relatively new for me. So I'm 50, but I haven't really discovered what I was really great at until the last three to five years, which is really disappointing. But um, that's why I'm so passionate about getting better people late that than are never, younger. man. Better late than never, right? Well, I know, and, I, and I'm really passionate about getting people that are younger to discover this sooner. So I ran into a company called Culture Index. Um, but there's lots of companies out there like Myers Briggs. Uh, if you haven't done the uh, what's that book, um, Strengths Finder. I love Strengths Finder. Yeah, I mean Strengths Finder is I think the best because it's so accessible. But Culture Index is was really good bec- as a corporate purchase for us. We buy it. You pay several thousand dollars a year, and I can run thousands of people through it for the same price. There's no like per testing oh, price. That's cool. Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a consulting thing, and so. It was when I started working with them. First of all, the way I started working with them is is the the guy that ran ran the office in Dallas met me at a lunch at a friend's office. He made me do this this survey, which takes less than ten minutes, and then which it's weird because it's a bunch of words, and you're just supposed to select which ones you feel are most like you. And then he gets this little printout with a bunch of colored dots on it, and then he starts. To, it's like reading tea leaves. He starts to tell me how I think, how I act. He asked me what problems I'm having with my business, um, and and then he would tell me he, – he, he was even telling me what problems I was having in my business based on the type of people I was hiring. It was it was really remarkable. So that's the first thing that helped me kind of really understand myself. The, the, the really big revelation is I was working with an organization – I don't know if you've heard of Entrepreneurial Operating System. So if you're – Anybody hasn't read the book Traction, they need to. Uh, If they haven't read Traction or a book called Rocket Fuel, this is really about how to run an entrepreneurial business. And I read that book and I became um, enamored with it immediately. And uh, I started using them as consulting. And there was this one meeting where we had a bunch of leaders in a room and we were consulting on how to run the business for the next quarter. And I got really mad and frustrated, and I said, I don't understand. I'm not that smart. I don't have a college degree, and I see things that nobody in this room sees, and everybody in this room I'm paying to be smarter than me. I don't get it. And my consultant <laughs> looked me in the eye and said, first of all, you are smart. Second of all, you see things that no one else sees. That's why you're the CEO. Yeah. That's what you do. That's yeah. your superpower. You right. see the world in a way no one else sees it. So stop fighting it. Stop saying that you're dumb or you don't have this education. It's 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 almost clairvoyance in a way that I see things that no one else sees. And I've got a really good team around me. And these are some pretty – I mean they're all older than me. They're veterans in the business. And they tell me every day, I, I don't know how you see this stuff. And it's to me it's just so obvious. And so if you ever heard a musician say, well, I just sat down and wrote that hit song that's, you know, one of the greatest songs of all time, you know, in my bathroom, <laughs> right. you hear right. that all the time and you think it's nuts, but it's not nuts. They're a special kind of genius. I don't have that special kind of genius, but everybody listening has a special kind of genius. You just got to find out what it is and tap into it and run with it and hold on to it and understand people are going to think that you are crazy. Um, you but that right. you, they're going to, and at, at some point you're just going to have to believe, and this is where it's harder when you're younger than it is when you're older. Cause when you get older, you just don't care as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's <laughs> like, okay, yeah. great. You're I one of dogs. those people. Dogs right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> I don't right. care what you think about me, but that's why I'm so passionate about getting uh, people that are younger to say, Hey, figure out what your special genius is. And you just, you know, if it's, if, if it's a, if it's a small hole, you drive a, a freight train through that hole, because you have something 
Um, you're an entrepreneur anyways. I mean, the DNA of the United States of America is entrepreneurism. If you think about it, right. we're an immigrant country. People came from all over the – basically, the only entrepreneur in any country left their country for an opportunity to come here. <laughs> and then they bred. So the entire country is entrepreneurs. I mean, we keep right. breeding. And so it's this is why we're this economic engine and why we have our unfair share of, of uh, economic successes because we're entrepreneurs. It's just who we are. Um, and so that's great. So it's already built into you. You live in a society where it's accepted – and, and entrepreneurs now are cooler than they ever been. I mean, thanks to Shark Tank right. and right. The Profit and Bar Rescue and all these shows that are basically businesses showing how to run businesses. And they're, they're, they've kind of made business sexy. Right. You know, I, it wasn't sexy. It wasn't the same. I mean, entrepreneurs were nut. nut jo- I mean, when I was in high right. school, they didn't know what to do with me. Right. Um, now they would probably be able to say, dude, you're an entrepreneur. You need to – and I would have been more successful faster had I been channeled correctly. So we live in really, right. really – times for the entrepreneur. So when you start to have success to bring it full circle, we want to keep as much of that money that you've earned because the tax code allows you to. Well, and and that's the thing is uh, oftentimes the I think the 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 tax code gets a, a bad rap as I've said earlier. But yeah. and, and just trying to understand that thing though, because we grow up thinking that you know because there's this uh, me John Wayne I can do it all by myself mentality sometimes, right. and that you that can't. I no not with no. would you say seventy thousand pages yeah seventy thousand pages, that's but think of it this way. And this this will actually give you a little bit more comfort in it. There's four to five pages in the tax code that says this is your tax. The other 70,000 okay. is this is how you get out of the tax. And which is interesting is people think of it as red lights and green lights. You know, if a red light, if we're all sitting at a red light, that's the safest place to be. No one's going through the intersection, so there's zero risk of an accident. But no one's moving either. So what congress has done is they've added laws to create movement and the way they create movement is with these green lights can you go through a green light and still get in an accident yes but just like if you use the tax law legally you still could get audited but are you likely to get audited are you likely to get pulled over for a ticket because you went through a green light No. no so why aren't you tapping into these green lights which there's more green lights 99% of the tax code is things you can do to lower your tax. And everyone is afraid of the stuff that's designed to help you lower the tax. Just use it. Okay, so then let me ask this question. Because what would you say, like if I put you on the spot, because again, we haven't like prepared and we still have everyone who's watching live and guys, you can ask your questions too. Uh, But what would you say is would be because you you had a wide range of, of customers and clients what would you say are like the top three things people who specifically do real estate as a business or as an investment or maybe even something you may have identified from an airbnb perspective that would be interesting to hear that we're not doing that are complete green lights that we just don't know about you do realize that what you don't know can has and always will hurt you I think that's one of the reasons you like listening. So I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for being here. And hopefully you are taking copious notes on this particular episode because we got a whole lot more for you in the second half. What's more important, though, is that you do something. Take some action. Move in the direction of the things that you know that you want. Well, a very simple action that just costs you a few keystrokes. Go pick up a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Last time, cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Now, pick it up, but read it. Read it and then do what it says. Because then you'll be able to start taking advantage of some of these advantages that you are learning about. It'll become your reality. That's the only way you're going to get even more benefit than you already have from episodes like this. Now, let's get back to it. All right. So real estate is great because first of all, real estate has whole segments of the tax code written just for it. Now, there's some there's some pros and cons of that. So if you go to like the a real estate investing course, they'll always tell you about, oh, you build these passive losses. What they don't tell you is that the only way to offset passive losses are with passive gains. 
So if you have a capital gain and a passive loss, they don't zero each other out. So that's kind of a problem. But what's so great about real estate investing is that if I if I earn if I if I take twenty thousand dollars and I buy a hundred thousand dollar house, so I'm now controlling a hundred thousand dollars with a twenty thousand dollar cost, but I get to depreciate right. the entire hundred thousand. Yep. So. But I'm not depreciating the 20. That's really all my my only capital is 20. So now I'm depreciating a bigger asset. I'm controlling a bigger asset and I'm contri- depreciating that entire asset. And then if I make 6% on it, I'm not really making 6% on it. Because if I'm getting a tax deduction that's equivalent to 6% and I'm making 6%, then my net is really 12. This is why real estate investing is kind of magic. <laughs> They're not actually, it's not kind of magic. It's flat out magic. It's numerical yeah. magic. Yes. It really is. So now, and then there's some cool laws like uh, accelerated depreciation that you can do with cost segregation once you get above certain levels. So if you have a half a million or above in total real estate that you're controlling, you need to do a cost segregation study because then you can depreciate under 10 years. So you're now going from these long depreciation schedules to these very short depreciation schedules. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, hold, on, hold on. Hold on one second because you <laughs> may have just inadvertently answered a question that I get all the time. I, what, what was that for cost segregation? How, how many dollars? And, and It's typically – so the companies that do it are kind of expensive. So you, in order to, to get the bang for the buck, we have found that a half a million in total real estate is the minimum. You really probably need to be closer to a million, but you should start – toying with it at a half a million because if you're doing well enough even at a half a million in controlled real estate you could zero out all of your income so at a half a million it, you might say well i have to write a twenty-five thousand dollar check to get the cost segregation study but if i don't have to pay taxes for nine years at all on any of my income hey twenty-five thousand and the twenty-five thousand is a business expense so you get a deduction for the twenty-five thousand and you don't have to pay any taxes over a period of time so this is how the wealthy get wealthier so real estate is very, very powerful. There's a lot of cool things. I mean, also, you're running your real estate out of your house, so there's several ways you can write off your house. If you have a swimming pool, you can write off your swimming pool. If you if you, you know, want to be in good shape because you want to you don't want to be fat and ugly when you <laughs> go present a house or something <laughs> and you want to work out, you can write off some of your your workout equipment. Um, your medical expenses can all be tax deductible. Uh, every time you leave your house, that's the mileage begins. So a real estate investor has a lot of opportunities. Some of these things I just threw out there, other than the cost segregation, uh, are stuff everybody, every business can use. But real estate has some very special rules. And so why do they have special rules? Because only rich people are allowed to use it? No. Congress has decided and the presidents have signed off on it that they want people investing in real estate because real estate is infrastructure and infrastructure is good for the economy. So there's special rules that allow for it. The, the biggest trap of real estate is, a real, is the passive losses. In fact, this is a great case to, to kind of explain to people. This is the case that made me decide to get into this business because it broke my heart. Oh, okay. So what happened was is I had an Asian couple that had immigrated to the United States. So I'm a huge fan of immigrants because that's what makes our country great. Um, and we're all we're all – children of immigrants, every single one of us. So <laughs> right. unless you're unless you're hundred percent Native American, you're an immigrant. So <laughs> true, right? So, no, I'm, I'm listening and I'm loving it. It's, it's, it's good. Keep going. So so there's this Asian couple, they're running a dry cleaner, which I did give them a hard time for. I was like, guys, a dry cleaner really? I mean, come on. I mean that's as well. stereotypical as you're gonna get. But okay. So they're running a dry cleaner. She's an engineer. She's taking her money, and they take the dry cleaner and they parlay it so that they can buy the strip mall that their dry cleaner is in. You know, very aggressive, very Makes difficult sense. to do, but they pulled it off um, and they bought it in 2008, just in oh. time for the strip mall to empty. Oh. So she's now sending her oh. entire six figure check from being an engineer to the strip mall. So fast forward a few years, she comes in my office, they have $350,000 in passive losses. And I said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to split your your split your strip mall from the dry cleaner into two separate businesses. The strip mall is going to be a real estate business. Real estate businesses can kick off passive income. Your strip mall is full now. So we're going to take and, – and you're not paying yourself rent from the dry cleaner. So by taking money from the dry cleaner, paying that rent into the strip mall, we're creating more passive income. We're going to use the new passive income 
to be offset by the $350,000 in losses. And based on your current income, you're not going to have to pay any taxes for three and a half years, which will save you approximately $175,000 in taxes. She was ecstatic. She took it to yeah. her CPA. CPA says, I'm not comfortable with that. I right. had the moral, ethical, legal discussion. He said, I'm not comfortable with that. And basically what I did is said, well, I can't help you. Well, this is one of those things where there's an affinity group. She was Asian. The CPA was Asian. I'm a white guy. I didn't have a chance. So wow. the Asian one. And that broke my heart because here's a couple that is a immigrant that's realizing the American dream. She's an engineer at a great company. They've started a business. They built, they got a strip mall. So they have a killer retirement. And this guy with a, with a decision saying, I'm not comfortable with that. He couldn't even defend why he wasn't comfortable with it. Cost this couple $175,000. And I couldn't stand for that. And so I said, we've got to fix this. This is, this is nuts. If accountants are going to block respectable people that are using their hard-earned money, I got to fix it. And that's, that's where Financial Gravity was born, is that particular accountant whose name I don't even know. Um, is, <laughs> <laughs> that particular accountant is costing a lot of accountants uh, a lot of money because Mr. We are, X. You know, yeah, we're going right <laughs> after them and saying, hey, if you're, if you're going to – if you're not going to use the 70,000 pages that Congress worked so hard to write for the U.S. economy because you're not comfortable with it. I've even joked that I want to trademark I'm not comfortable with it, so at least I get paid when they say that. I know, right? I know. It's just it's – just, I'm not comfortable. What does that even mean? You're supposed to be accountants. You're supposed to be like the most rational business owners on the planet, and I kept getting I'm not comfortable with that, and it's that's not rational. Give me some – tell me why. If, if there's a legal reason that if I'm doing something illegal – Hey, by, by all means. But what's interesting is that every tax strategy we use, we attach to the Internal Revenue Code. So if we tell of you, course. hey, if you do this, you can save $10,000, and here's where it is in the Internal Revenue Code, so you can go there. One of our strategies, which gets a lot of pushback from people because it's so good, is you can stash $1.2 million a year tax-free. Uh, go on. So <laughs> you, you now have my attention. Yeah. So here's what's interesting about this strategy. This strategy has been in the code for several decades. In 2002, the IRS says we don't like it because too many people are saving money using it. So they sued a company that was using it. And that company happened to be United Parcel Service. United Parcel Service has deep pockets. They fought back. They won. So now we have tax code that says it's legal. And now we have a court case that says it's legal if you do these three things. So all we do is follow the code and these three things, and it's legal. What's interesting is last December, <laughs> during, during uh, the holidays, uh, Congress increased this particular strategy from $1.2 million a year to $2.2 million a year, and President Obama signed it. So a Republican legislature and a hmm. Democrat president signed into law an increase from 1.2 to 2.2. So now we've got the court saying it's okay. We've got the legislature making it better. We've got the president making it better. And we've got law that's been there for decades and nobody's using it. Okay. You know, I got to ask, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, you know, so, I, as I, so, so a couple of a couple before I tell you what it is, because I want everyone hanging on the edge of the seat. So yeah, don't worry. They're hanging off. right now. Are they definitely doing that? Yeah, no, no, no one's no one's turning off. So the, the what's interesting is the IRS is still targeting the strategy. I'm not sure why. Um, they target a lot of strategies that make them. They don't even like 401ks. You know, the most targeted strategy by the IRS is the 401k, which is weird because everybody has one and no one thinks that's that scary. But it's the single most aggressively targeted strategy that the the IRS goes after to try to deconstruct to see if it's being done wrong. Which I think is weird, but anyways, the name of the, the name of the strategy is called captive insurance. So basically, you're setting up an insurance company. It's very complex. It's very expensive. We're talking fifty thousand dollars or more a year. But if I can stash two million a year, and I live in California, which puts me in the sixty percent tax bracket, and I can stash two million, I save one point two million in taxes, and it's an insurance company. So I end up with all these other benefits that are really good to have for a small business owner. Whoa, I now can whoa, sure. whoa, 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 hold on. Did you just say I could have my, you're, hold on, what? 
Yeah. Say that again. You can set up your <laughs> own insurance company. And those package. other and those other benefits come along with it. Yeah. So you. So and let, it's let me only give you an fifty example. grand. So let's see. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. That's well. That's why everyone says like I tell people I like tell people it's really expensive and they're like, that's not really expensive. If I if I'm saving one point two million dollars a year in taxes, fifty thousand seems like a small price to pay, <laughs> and it is. So think of uh, what happened in Louisiana with the with the last storm. If I had built one of these insurance companies for myself and I had stashed a million dollars a year and my business got wiped out, I would use this money that I stashed tax-free. This is why it's in the code, by the way. I put the money in there tax-free. It grows taxable as capital gains, um, but I can then take the money out tax-free and supplement my income while I'm rebuilding my life due to a storm because the storm, you know, if my insurance right now would cover maybe the building of my business, but it doesn't cost, it doesn't cover the lost income. Right. So most businesses after Katrina are gone. Had they had this type of insurance, which is called captive insurance, they would still be in business. Congress recognizes it. The president recognizes that this is a value, valuable thing that needs to exist within our country. So they didn't strip the rules out. They enhance them. So this is, it is funny is this kind of stuff happens all the time. And that's why I love the tax code, because it's the one area where Democrats and Republicans agree quite a bit. Um, even, even as much rancor has existed between uh, Clinton and Trump, if you look at their tax strategies, about 75% of both of them are the same. So it's really remarkable that when it comes to public policy and you get away from all the personalities and all the kind of the BS that goes along with the, the game of politics, and hey, it is a game now. <laughs> they, they even treat it like a sport. And everyone's 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 deciding what this person's doing and why this person's like, it's like, it's like football. Uh, but the idea is, right. is that armchair really, president. Yeah, it really is. Everyone's like, Oh, they should have done this. And you know, they shouldn't have said it this way. And it's just nuts. The whole thing is, it's theater. Um, and I don't care who gets elected because my attitude is, is I'm an entrepreneur and my job is to adapt to whatever is given me. I get one vote and then that's it. So I don't care who gets elected because my job they're going to they're going to do stuff that they said they weren't going to do. <laughs> they're not going to follow through <laughs> stuff on this they said they were going to do. Perfect. And I'm a business owner. I have to I just have to figure it out. And even with Obamacare, right. which a lot of small business owners hate, there are I I could cut every small business owner's health insurance by 50% by using Obamacare and a 50-year-old tax law by combining them. Obamacare's tax law there's tax law on the health side that has been in the tax code for 50 years, and everyone's complaining about how expensive healthcare is, but no one's tapping into the systems that have been built. And if you do, you can save up to 50% on your healthcare costs every year, no matter what the business is. And it's no one's talking about it. It's, so this is the stuff. This is well, what okay. Uh, you you keep saying no one's talking about it, dude. We can't read that far. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the problem. We well, but, can't the, but, but you can't. But why aren't accountants screaming this? Why aren't accountants saying, they hey, clearly didn't read it in, either. Hey, <laughs> I mean, if you go into your accountant, and he says you're paying how much for health insurance? You know, I can cut your premium in half if you do these three things. Why aren't they doing that? That and that's a, and that's that is a, a bigger problem. And I, I actually have solutions for it. Um, but the the bigger problem is the accounting industry doesn't know financial products. And they don't know tax because they're actually not trained in tax or trained in accounting. The financial services industry doesn't know tax, doesn't know accounting, and all they really sell is product. So if I'm selling health insurance, how do I get paid? I get paid on a percentage of the premium. So is it in my best interest to cut your premium in half? No. Really. So all the people that you're getting advice on on how to lower your insurance premiums have zero incentive to lower your insurance premiums. So, and most financial advisors are not advisors at all. They're salespeople selling product. So you've got the accounting on one side that isn't helping with tax because they're historians. And you got financial services on the other side that's all product pushers. So, and, and you and I are in the middle saying, how do I make decisions that help me run my business better so that I can have more money to feed my business and employ people and grow? And the answer is, there, it doesn't exist. Okay. So okay. Okay. We built right. that, and, that's and, our businesses. We built. Yeah, I know. We that. feel this, and we feel squeezed. We feel all of these things, all of these pressures, trying to make, you know, something happen. My, I guess the the question becomes, you know, 
d- d- what's an entrepreneur to do? I mean, you know how many people have been in business before they hear something like what you're talking about? You know how many businesses went out of business yesterday because they didn't yeah. know some of the things that you're saying? And I mean, it. it what is it that that an entrepreneur is to do because when you when between all the regulation we face when we start something new the, oh the, gosh the, yeah. our, ourselves don't and, even get you know, started on regulation <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm just saying it's an uphill battle from the beginning and you're saying well it's also an uphill battle at the end you know well it, so the way i the way i explain it to clients is look you got the way you've got to control what you can control so this is why I think the elections just it's it's a it's it's fantasy. A lot of people they think they're getting control in the elections because they get to choose whoever is going to be the the next person. And they think that by choosing their person, if their person wins, they think they have something that's better and then they find out that that person's not the person they thought they were. Um and I I point this out to people all the time. Uh the first Clinton presidency was one of the most conservative presidencies from policy. Bush's presidency was very liberal from a policy standpoint, which they neither of them got elected by those parties. So it's our job not to, I mean, we, we need to vote. Everyone gets one vote, so let's all vote. But what we shouldn't worry about is what happens after the vote is cast. Now our job is to adapt and control the things that are within our power. We can't control if Uber wipes us out. But if we're a taxi company and we see the threat of Uber and we don't start building our own app, that's on us. So just start. Well, well, with- okay. Well, 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 hold on. You're hitting close to home for me on this one because the same thing is, yeah, it's on them, but they're, they're, they've not chosen to do things like that. They've more chosen to slow Uber down with lawsuits. Government. And, yeah. And, so, but that's, and but mess. That's, yeah. That's what big companies always do. So big companies will always use the strong arm of the government overreach to protect their position. Um, And large companies, it's funny because large companies are free market capitalists until they become the big company and then they want to be a monopoly because because they don't want competition. (laughs) Right. It's it's hard. So that's just, but that's, that's the cycle. So it's not fair. You know, it's not fair that my, my daughters don't listen to me. Um, it's not fa- fair that I'm getting older and fatter. <laughs> so stop complaining about what's not fair. Just deal with the, the stuff in front of you. Nice. So one of the things that we have available for for people, in fact, I'll this is this is something. Here's where you start. You text the word tax book to three three four four four. So the word one word tax book to three three four four four. You text that. You'll get a text, and then you'll put in your email address, and you'll get a free downloadable book that talks about the 10 biggest tax mistakes business owners make. So nice. you will now have the biggest tax mistakes and how to fix them. So if you don't do anything with that knowledge, once again, that's on that's you. That's on me. Yeah, if, I if get that. If you read it and you say, this seems too complicated, let's say you're a designer. Let's say you're a real estate investor. Real estate investors are probably good at picking the right house at the right time in the right neighborhood. But they read the tax book and they're like, I don't understand this. And their head explodes. <laughs> that's fine. Then they hire someone that can help them implement the strategies. And that's that's what's great about our society, which is the reason why robots will never take over the world, is everything gets more complex and we niche, we keep niching down. We keep getting more and more focused. And as we niche down, it requires us to collaborate. I cannot be a renaissance man and do everything myself. I have to work with people some of them I may or may not like, but they're better at it than me. So I mean, I have lots of attorneys, and I don't like most of them, but I need them. So that's that's part of life. So so I get them. Yeah, lean lean on companies like us. Uh, get the free book. Go to our website, Financial Gravity. Um, we have a free video series at LowerTaxHigherProfit.com where I walk through several strategies the, the down the, the free book is downloadable through that video series as well so the first thing the first step of a thousand miles you know the first you know on was it the the journey of a thousand miles start the right. step so just start now that you know that the tax code is an embarrassment of riches there's all kinds of cool stuff in there that can help you lower your costs which will then accelerate your growth because that's less of a drain on your profit it's up to you to tap into it so at some point you got to take responsibility for your own life. I don't take responsibility for the fact that I didn't go to college. That's my fault, but I don't care because I've read, I, I read more books than 
95 percent of the, the the students that have gotten out of college with a master's degree i'll, I'll stack right. my knowledge against theirs because i'm i'm i didn't quit after most people quit after they get a degree i i've been learning constantly i read books every single day in my Got car it. so i listen to podcasts like this i mean you can learn right there's great podcasts all over the place so so, OK. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. We've been talking a little bit uh, about a, a lot of different things as we've gone through this particular process today. So uh, what, here, here's what uh, here's what I want to do. I know that their brains are full by this point, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I, what I want to do is and thanks for the, the, the free items. Many of them can you know figure out how to get in the text and to go there because they're already listening on a mobile device anyway. Um, right. What uh, what I do want to do though, is that I've got to ask you this last question because I'm really curious of your answer. Here, here's what I believe. I believe that today, listening, someone out there, uh, it, you know, if you would for, for a moment, just imagine, John, that someone is standing in front of what I call the superhero outfit store. They think, ooh, I want to do this entrepreneur thing. Yes, it is cool. It's sexy now. Maybe it's something I can pull off. Um, maybe it's in real estate. It doesn't really matter, but they think they want to do this. They want to make it happen. However, in the back of their mind, they have that voice. And you know that voice. You've done battle with that voice. We do battle with it all the mm-hmm. time. But you've overcome it. I mean, and it's that voice that comes up when you want to become bigger, better, better. It's that voice that comes up that says, I want to be great. But it's that voice for some people, they're actually related to that voice. And my question to you, sir, is if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the person listening right now would actually follow through on what you were about to say, and they would follow through in the next 24 to 48 hours, what would you suggest that they do? Don't listen to the voice. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, let me give you an example. I was at a, a uh, for those of you, I don't know if you've heard of an organization called Entrepreneur's Organization. Uh, it's known by EO for the people yeah, that EO. are. EO is yeah, EO. Yeah, EO, great organization. So I was at a, an EO event, and a guy was speaking, and he's had everyone stand up, and he says, I'm going to list a, a list of uh, 10 characteristics. Once I get to five, sit down. And by the time he read off all 10 of these characteristics, everyone had sit down, sat down proudly. You know, oh, yes, I'm that, I'm that. Everyone was proud. He says, well, I just listed the characteristics of someone that's bipolar. Wow. So everybody in the room, all entrepreneurs, to be an EO, you have to have a, a business that does at least a million dollars in revenue or above. So these are all successful entrepreneurs, all live with the characteristics of bipolar. So the voices are real. And it is, <laughs> no doubt. And they're real and they're negative and they're scary. There's another great right. book on this side that, called The Hypermanic Edge. The, it is being an entrepreneur is not, is, is not as much of a gift as is a curse. It is who we are and – it's we get to see the sexy stuff on TV, but it is a very difficult journey to be on. And that's why, you, first of all, it's very lonely because you don't think anyone else is as nuts as you are. And that's why organizations right. like uh, EO are great. But I'm telling you, you've got to it, it's you're going to have the voices. There are going to be days where you're despondent. And if that happens, don't go to work. Just don't go because you're not going to be productive anyways. I know. right? So so I have done that. Yeah, it's smart, and it's it, it's you feel guilty. You're like, I should, there should be, you know, I'm yeah. feeling terrible. I should be doing something to make myself not feel terrible. But sometimes right. the thing you need to do is just not do anything. Um, so just understand that the voices are there. They're they're negative. They're always negative. They're never saying how great you are. <laughs> they're always saying how awful you are <laughs> and how stupid you are. Ah. So you have to fight through them, and it's just part of the it's part of the journey, and it's it's the gift and the curse. It's the Achilles heel. Um, and just, I mean, if someone told me 20 years ago that the, the doubt and the angst that comes with this gift we have, um, was there, then maybe I would have been able to deal with it better, but we have to fight through it. But there's a lot of good books on it and just understand that we're all living it. Um, our brains race. I mean, someone explained it to me. It's imagine having a Ferrari engine with bicycle brakes. That's the entrepreneur. (laughs) Yeah. And those brakes wear out real quick. And they wear out real quick. <laughs> and it's it's hard on marriages because yeah. our women, I mean, we're attracted to our opposite. 
<laughs> so, so, you know, my wife is docile and doesn't get business even a little bit. And, you know, she's sweet and not driven. And, you know, it's, you know, she, it's just, it, we are attracted to our opposite. So it's very hard for a, a woman or, or a man to be married to an entrepreneur that's wired like we are. So we have to be, we have to be comfortable with who we are, deal with it, understand it, you know, adapt to it and make sure that our spouses understand that we understand that we are crazy, right. but it's okay because we actually yeah. run the world. <laughs> I know. I, mean, I know. Read, well, read uh, Elon Musk's. It's just, it's amazing that a guy like Elon Musk already has a biography and the stuff that's not in the biography is the stuff that's happened in the last two years. I mean, which is staggeringly amazing. So the guy's young and he's got this biography um, read it. I mean, you're going to see a guy that you've actually watched, you know, before your very eyes. And, you know, he almost didn't make payroll on Tesla. I mean, have, right. imagine having to wake up and knowing that today you're not going to make payroll and your company's name is Tesla. And that's I don't a big have to payroll. imagine most of that, but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. And it's, just, it's, just, it's a scary place to be. And right. he right. had to deal with it. And, and we may not have this, as many zeros, but we've had the same thing happen. Right. Um, and then people on, that are listening right now, are they've had it happen. If you've, if you've been on the entrepreneurial journey for more than 15 minutes, it's happened. <laughs> so, totally. Yeah, so it, but it's, we don't get it. I mean, we get to watch Shark Tank and see the sexiness of being a, a business owner, but we don't get to see the pain. So the pain is there. The pain is real. Um, but you have to go, you just have to go through it. It's, it's, it's moving through the fire and you can, because a lots of people have done it before you, so you can do it too. Indeed, It's not going to be any easier. No. <laughs> so I, I don't, I never, I never minimize anybody's pain because I know it's still pain, but, uh, you got to get through it. We all have, and I'm going to have it again. Um, there's going to be days where I think that the business is never going to make it. And there's going to be days that we're going to do a hundred million dollars by next year. Um, oh, no. That's that's the journey. So, so it's, it's the superpower and the super curse. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, sir. So here's what I want to do. I, I definitely just I just want to say thanks. I mean, you you have a plethora of knowledge and wisdom and insight, especially as it relates to the tax code, and you've shared it, but also. You've also shared the the thought process behind how to be a better entrepreneur, and I totally appreciate everything that you've shared with us today uh, here at the Cashflow Diary. My pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? It means you probably should head on over to financialgravity.com. It means you've heard so many books, so many resources, and if nothing else, you now know you ain't crazy alone, which is great because we're all right there with you. So let's go make something happen today. Push something forward because you can do it. It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.